But anyways, um, thank you so much to everybody for coming. Uh, you're all very welcome to Herpless Data. Uh, this is our second online event, and this time it's going to be a panel event. Uh, so I just wanna run through some general guidance for this evening. The first is to please be kind to yourself and to others. Um, so this means that, you know, we're all, you know, uh, living in quite unprecedented times at the minute, so we might have various um, pressures on ourselves. This is a parenthood in your career event, so some people might have children or other caring responsibilities, so just be mindful that people might have to come and go and, and handle various situations as they arise. But also be kind to yourself. If you've been online all day and you need to step away from the event for any reason, please feel empowered to do so. Um, this event is being recorded, so you can always catch up on it, um, catch up on it again after the event. Um, so in that case, uh, you're very welcome to have your um, video on if you don't mind sharing your face, um, but otherwise turn it off if you do mind sharing your face. Uh, please keep yourself muted when not speaking in order to minimize background noise. Um, and feel free to engage and ask any questions in the chat. It should hopefully be on. Let me just double check that and make sure those settings. Everybody can now chat um, publicly, um, so feel free to do that. Um, and if you have any issues or if you need to report anything, feel free to uh, message me. Um, and please do not share the Zoom link publicly, and that's just to minimize anybody sabotaging the event. So uh, tonight we have our panel, which will start in a few minutes. Um, I'm just going to run through some announcements really quick, and then I'm going to hand over to Becky, who's going to also make some announcements from Tech Returners and Women in Tech North. And then we'll get on with our Parenthood and Your Career panel. We aim to finish by 8 p.m. tonight in order to give everybody the opportunity to go and clap for our essential workers. So. Uh, I'm, my name is Rachel, I'm here representing Herpless Data, and if you haven't been to one of our events before, our mission is to bring together women uh, with a connection to data. So we want to provide a safe space where we can support and celebrate each other, share experience and knowledge, establish meaningful connections, and talk data. Um, we do have a code of conduct which was linked on the registration page, um, but basically we don't tolerate harassment of any kind, and if you need to report any misconduct, um, please uh, message me directly, um, either uh, through the chat or on Meetup. Um, I'll just give the other Herplus Datas an opportunity to uh, say hello, so Bernadette, if you would like to wave, and then if Mona, you would like to wave. We are your Herpless Data organizers, so feel free to get in touch with any of us if, um, if you have anything you want to chat about. Um, this is normally where I show all of the group photos from our previous events, but like I said, my screen sharing isn't working at the minute, and I should have tested that beforehand, but something always has to go wrong at a tech event, doesn't it? Um, but this is basically just your two-minute warning that I'm going to take a quick group photo um, at the end of my announcement, so I'll basically just take a screenshot of the group if that's okay. Um, so with her plus data, we have a meetup group that you're very welcome to join if you identify as a woman, um, but anybody can follow along on our Twitter page. And uh, this is our first fully open event, so you're all very welcome, and we hope to do more of these events in the future. Um, our next event is on uh, the second Thursday of June, so June 11th. It'll be at the same time, and it will be in collaboration with Open Data Manchester. So um, keep an eye out. We'll be announcing um, the speakers for that soon. But tonight, we're very excited to host a Parenthood in Your Career panel. We have Becky Taylor from uh, Women in Tech North and Tech Returners, if you'd like to wave, Becky. We have Danielle Smith, um, Head of Information Technology Operations at Auden, if you would like to wave, Danielle. We have Robin Ellis, Head of Learning and Development at uh, TransportAtBrooking.com. And we have Dan Reed, Head of Digital and Platform Delivery at Barclays and also founder of Career Dad. And he is also the first man to speak at one of our events. So sorry if, if that's embarrassing, but it, it's very exciting for us as well. Um, I just really quickly want to thank the Software Sustainability Institute, which covers the cost of our meetup page. And of course, thank you so much to uh, Bernadette and Evolution Recruitment Solutions, who have been supporting us uh, since we began. And I think that's it. Uh, Mona, would you like to um, summarize briefly the feedback that we got from the last event? Oh, yeah. So, like I said, I don't think the screen sharing is working. Oh, you don't see it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, how did I not uh, get it to work? I don't know. 
Um, yeah, so we ran a survey uh, after the last event because it was the first one that we actually ran remotely. So we wanted to know how you find it. Thanks to all of you who, who um, um, yeah, answered the survey. And actually it was really overwhelming, yeah, overwhelmingly positive. Um, so most of you really liked the event and uh, thought they would definitely uh, attend the future event. So 17 out of 19 in total. Um, and um, you said you would definitely attend it uh, again during lo lockdown, uh, which is probably why we have so many of you here. And quite a few, so around half, also um, were yeah were, uh, were very very positive around uh, even attending such an event um, when it's not when we're when we're not have, uh, having to stay at home. Um, so we'll um, yeah we, right now we are still locked down, so we didn't really have to make any decisions around um, yeah. Uh, having any remote events um, after lockdown, but we'll definitely take this into account um, when, when planning future events. So thanks a lot. And another piece of feedback um, that was quite frequent was that uh, the duration of the event was quite long, which is why this time uh, we only have one hour, all, uh, all of us together. Thanks so much, Rona. Um, and I'll hand over to Becky. You're still muted. Oh, sorry. Am I Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi, I'm Becky. I am co-founder of Tech Turners and uh, Women in Tech North. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to Her Plus Data to inviting us to collaborate on this event. Um, on behalf of Kate and Azu, who are also on the, I can see they're on the uh, call. I can see Kate waving there. Um, you know, we're the Women in Tech North panel, um, and so you can find us on Meetup under Women in Tech North. Um, in terms of our future events, we've just decided today, very last minute, <laughs> that our next event is going to be on the 23rd of June at 7pm. We'll pop it on Meetup tomorrow. Um, and it's all about thriving post lockdown in terms of diversity and the remote workforce. So we've got three fantastic speakers lined up and we'll share more details on meetup.com um, there tomorrow. Also on behalf of Tech Returners, we're currently um, doing a series of webinars called The C Word, um, and C not meaning coronavirus, it's actually meaning community. So we've actually had um, a discussion around virtual imposter syndrome uh, today, and then next week we've got one on the growth mindset and also um, personal brand. So if you're interested in those, either connect with me on LinkedIn under Becky Taylor or go to our website, which you'll find the link to sign up to those. Um, also, we announced today, so I'm really passionate um, in terms of my role at Tech Returners around personal development. So we've launched a series called Starting With I programme, which is a series of five one hour sessions starting the 8th of June, talking all about your personal development. So talking about subjects around understanding you, imposter syndrome, confidence, resilience and building your uh, career goals. Um, it's £34 for the week, uh, so five sessions for £34. 34 pounds and 10 percent of all profits that we make go to the awards the nhs charities so if anyone's interested in them again please get in contact or see our website thank you brilliant thanks so much becky and i'm just going to very quickly take a screenshot of as the group photo if that's all right so if you would like to be in it feel free to turn on your video if you don't want to be in it feel free to keep your video off but in three two one Awesome. Thank you so much for, um, yeah, humoring me. All right. And now I'm going to hand over to Mona, who is going to chair the panel. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, so we've got uh, our, our, our four panelists um, ready to answer your questions. Uh, we have been, uh, we have collected some questions already beforehand, but if you've got anything else that's on your mind that you might not have been able to, uh, to raise at uh, registration, please do post it in the chat um, and uh, we'll, yeah, we'll see how many uh, of your questions we get around to. Uh, we'll start with uh, introductions from each of the panelists. So Becky, do you want to make a start? Yeah, 
Um, so just briefly introduce myself before. So I am co-founder and CEO of the company called Tech Returners and also co-founder of Women in Tech North. Um, in terms of Tech Returners, we support people entering and re-entering tech after a career break. Uh, we set up the business uh, just over two years ago and work um, alongside companies such as UBC, Booking.com, Lloyds Banking Group in terms of supporting businesses um, and returners transition uh, from career break. So it's a real big passion in terms of this subject to me, in terms of the whole business was set up on my personal experience about returning to work. So I can't wait to share my insights in terms of that, in terms of the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Danielle, do you want to go next? Hi, um, I'm Head of IT Ops at Auden. Uh, it's a relatively new role to me because unfortunately, I was made redundant from lakerooms.com um, when it went bump last year. Um, so kind of the topics that I'm going over is kind of the challenges of coming into a new role. Um, if you find yourself on the job market whilst pregnant, uh, I'm currently still on maternity leave being very well looked after, uh, thankfully, and multitasking with two little ones in the background. So apologies if we have some interruptions. Thanks, Danielle. Let's have Robin next. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Robin Ellis, I'm Head of Learning and Development for Booking.com. We uh, love our Tech Returners programme, a brilliant <laughs> group uh, who have joined, joined us. Um, uh, I've been coaching people through career transitions for the last eight years, both through working in the charity sector, the education sector, uh, and obviously the tech sector. So I can speak to it from that point of view. I also don't have children, but I have had, uh, I have covered maternity contracts before. And so there's a little piece that we wanted to talk about maybe a little bit later about being that good, uh, good leader, good returner and kind of paving the way for those colleagues who are going to be with and around you and how to build that a, a relationship really effectively. Um, if that's a part of your... Thanks, Robin. And last but not least, we have a first at her plus data. <laughs> that we have a male attendee, in fact. Uh, there's a particular reason for that, so I'll hand it over to you, Dan. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm honoured to be the, the first man uh, to be at one of these events, so thank you for having me. I'm, I'm Dan Reed. I head up digital and platform delivery over at Barclays, so predominantly looking at the B2B side, uh, focusing on Barclays cards, that's websites, marketing automation, and new uh, technology platforms really how do we embed them in and, and make them uh, work which can be challenging um, at the back end of last year as, as well I started my own business which is career dad and that's all around uh, predominantly supporting dads in the workplace and the reason for that is one being a dad myself um, and struggling with parental guilt and the fact that guys don't really talk about the struggles um, but the other side of it as well is that Prior to that, for, for a number of years, I've been involved as a, a he for she male ally and uh, the Women's Initiative Network throughout Barclays. And actually going into the research, finding out that one of the main issues in uh, gender equality and the gender pay gap is dads and men not being brought on the journey and actually feeling like that they can't step up to the plate. Therefore, who is going to be left with the childcare while well, it's going to be the mums, right? So I want to try and help empower the dads that want to do this to say, look, if you do this, not only are you going to get the benefit from it, but also you're going to be helping towards the, the, the gender pay gap. Um, so the career dad is, is about doing talks and, and webinars and um, workshops predominantly around flexible working and also supporting dads in the workplace. Great. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so um why don't we start um first with a question around dads then because it's um yeah it's it's uh, it's, it's an interesting topic and um, you just made a start on it so sure. you said you talked to lots of dads um and we're now also in a particular situation with lockdown where uh, we we have to share even more parenting responsibilities so what do dads tell you how do they perceive this what do they struggle with what is it that they might not be telling us as their others <laughs> potentially? That's uh, uh, that that could be a very loaded question. So I'll, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's it's really interesting, right? And I think that where 
I always preface this by saying that what I talk about is the dad's perspective, but actually the dad's perspective is generally the same as the mum's perspective. And that's part of it, right? That there's not two divides. There's just two sides of the, the same coin. So what I'm hearing a lot around is uh, guilt. Um, and I'd say dad guilt, but I'm sure that what I'm going to talk about, uh, there'll be everyone else here will be able to relate to. So it's parental guilt. I think the main things that dad's talked to me around with guilt is, um, and I've kind of, I imagine it as almost this, this circle, right? So you have the dad who says, I want to provide for my family. And they generally equate that provision to financial provision. So that means that I'm going to work really, really hard and earn lots of money so that I can give my family the best possible life. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Sounds great. Then what happens is they work really, really hard and that work then takes them away from having family time. And then you can kind of get this split where the, uh, the partner or, or wife or whoever is saying, well, I never see you. You're always working. And I feel like that I'm picking up the, the kids side of it, that slack. And then the guys go in, in often in his head, because guys generally don't like to talk about stuff, is going, well, hang on a minute. I'm I'm doing this for you. I'm working incredibly hard to provide you and the family this fantastic lifestyle and you're getting angry that I'm not here, but how can I do that? And what I'm finding is dads who get to that stage are not communicating about it. They're doubling down in what they know, which is the work. So then we're kind of coming up this side of the circle. The dads are focused even more so on the work, earning more money. There becomes kind of a rift and, you know, I was speaking to one dad, dad at the back end of last year about this exact thing. And, and he said to me, I wish we'd spoken a year ago because unfortunately for him, his, his marriage had just broken down, which is the, the complete extreme, right? But it's, it's real. And I think where, where I come at this from, because I could see myself on that journey, um, you know, five or six years ago, thinking, well, I want, surely I'm doing the best because I'm, I'm providing as much as I can for my family. And, I, and thankfully, I, I had a friend call me out on this who said, you know, um, with, with the greatest respect, how much provision do you need? Like, you know, you can you can pay the bills, the mortgage is covered, you go on, you go on holiday. What more do you know? No one's wanting for it. How much more do you need? And that really got me thinking because I thought, I don't think I am 100 percent doing it for the family. I think that I'm doing it for the family, but I'm also doing it for me. And it might seem insignificant, but that, that almost acknowledgement and realization was really powerful for me. And now that I've spoken to predominantly other dads about it, I've found it's really powerful for them because no longer when the partner is saying, well, you're working, you're always working and I never see you. Can you have that resentment of going, well, I'm doing this for you and you don't understand it's going, well, I am doing it for you, but I'm also doing it for me. I'm doing and selfishly so. I'm doing it for my satisfaction, for my intellectual stimulation, for my social group. And then it's more of a trade-off. So I think that that's what I'm actually spending a lot of time talking to dads around at the moment. And I, I kind of call it the who, who is it for? Like, who are we doing it for, really? I think that coupled with... Um, trying to work from home, trying to homeschool, trying to do everything, trying to be everything to everyone. And I think, and again, this isn't necessarily a dad specific thing, but because guys historically aren't ones for talking or opening up, they're putting themselves to the bottom of the list of, of priorities. And there's that, that old adage, you know, apply your own oxygen mask first. And if we, and I felt this too, feel like, well, you know, I'm not going to go for that run because uh, I'm going to uh, look after my, my daughter or I'm going to play with my son or I'm going to do the dinner or whatever it is. They're not necessarily bad things to do. But I think if that rolls on day after day, week after week, it can start to really, really uh, bring, bring people down. So it's just really that forum to, to have a conversation to say, look, it's OK to not be OK, but let's talk about it and don't don't bottle it down. Oh, Robin, please go ahead. Uh, thanks so much for that, Dan. I think it's really interesting that it's the other side of the coin for the advice and the coaching uh, and the support that we often have to give to our mums coming into the workplace of being uh, of, of also having to say, I want to work for me. 
and to kind of also go with that guilt but it kind of be the other the other side of that coin to be able to stand up and actually say and that's okay and so I think there's a really interesting uh, can be sometimes really interesting dynamic in households um, but also in workplaces where you've got people at the same point in their uh, career who are kind of looking at this from completely opposite directions yeah absolutely We've We've had this also as a question from participants around, um, yeah, how do, you, how do you get rid of the guilt and um, how uh, is this looking for moms? And I know that both you, um, Becky and Danielle, you're both career women as well. And I think Becky also um, has a story to tell around her maternity leave and uh, returning from maternity leave. And how did, how, yeah, how did you maybe um, keep yourself from, from feeling guilty about your choices? You're still muted. I need to learn not to mute, not to, usually have someone controlling it for me. So, it's a bit, <laughs> um, so yeah, I suppose I'll just share a little bit of a story around this. So, um, and I like to be quite open about my sort of experience because I hope it sort of resonates with a few people. Um, so six and a half years ago, um, I fell pregnant with Ethan who um, quickly nipped in before. Um, and I was delighted, del absolutely delighted. I spent a long time trying to get pregnant. So when I did do, it was just obviously the, the most amazing thing. At that moment in time, I was um, head of HR for a, um, a successful scale-up tech business in Manchester. Um, and I was the only woman on the leadership team. And so then it, the, when it got closer and closer about getting on to maternity leave, it came more and more daunting around in terms of what effect it was going to have on my career. Um, but I sort of followed the norm um, and the norm being that, you know, you take that nine months maternity leave. And so, which I did so, and I was dipping in and out of work, but I wasn't actually in the office. So I was at home just catching up on emails every so often. So then it went on to that. I went on to the baby clubs. I felt I had to do baby massage, sing and sign, all, all the, the sign groups. And I realized how much sort of that, not at that time, but reflecting back how much it wasn't me. Um, I didn't fit in. Um, I even lost so much confidence that when I went to a breastfeeding support group, I took my mum because I just didn't feel that I actually could have that general conversations with the other people there. It, it was most bizarre as feeling. And then when I went back into work, um, and it was probably my first realisation that not only was I was a minority of being a woman in tech, I was a minority of being um, a parent in tech, it started to get me to realise and reflect about how much um, having that, those nine months off really um, affected me. Um, I felt that I'd lost a skill set in, in an ever-changing tech career, um, that tech moves so quickly. I couldn't go to any networking events, everything seemed to be in the evenings, and therefore not making it really accessible, and just really impacting my confidence. Um, hence, I said at the beginning, that's why one of the reasons why um, we set up the business Tech Returners, um, just felt that there was an absolute massive gap in the market supporting people returning or entering tech after a career break. So. Through that learning, then when, um, again, um, had a long period of time of trying to get pregnant and then fell pregnant with my daughter, Emmy, um, I decided to do things differently. Um, I sort of decided very from much the off that I wouldn't have maternity leave. Um, and it got frowned upon. Um, and, and a lot of people were very judgmental um, about my, my decisions, but I knew that it was something that was right for me at that time. So I worked up right up until two weeks before um, I had Emmy. Um, I remember at my baby shower going, oh yeah, I'm fine. I've got two weeks to buy everything. You know, everything's going to be fine. And then I went in for a routine appointment on the Monday. Blood pressure was sky high. Um, I had um, protein in my urine and I had suspected preeclampsia. And it was like, right, you're not going home. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm not going home? I've not bought one single thing for her. I've not done anything. I had this two weeks in my mind plan to do everything. Um, and then I ended up um, having an emergency C-section, but everything was fine and everything was good. So I ended up um, actually having 19 days off um, and that wasn't planned in my, my little world. Um, and then I went, decided to go back. I decided to go back after 19 days. And uh, the first day I was actually running a... Um, one of our development courses for the co-op 
Um, and I had my mum pushing around, I mean, around uh, Manchester because I was breastfeeding at the time. So she had to keep coming back in, back in and back out. And, and I was dead open in terms of that. And then um, during the, you know, the first six months, she was coming into work for me. So she did a first podcast when she was two weeks old, uh, sorry, three weeks old. Then she was doing a first event when she was a month old. And that's what was right for me. And so to tell this story, because uh, I believe that when I first had Ethan, I, it was almost, I felt I was having to have a choice between having children and having my career. And then I re soon realized that why do I have to cho choose? Nobody should have to choose between one and the other. You can have both. And so, yeah, obviously not everybody can bring a baby into work and, you know, feed and have meetings and things like that. But those choices should be yours. Um, and I suppose I wrote a blog about it. I speak about it now because I think though whatever your decision is, it should be the right decision for you at one given time. And now I'll talk to companies about this because from my HR hat on, one policy, black and white policy about maternity leave, uh, paternity leave, adoption leave, uh, flexible working doesn't mean the same for everybody. It should be very bespoke. And I sometimes forget, I think we forget the art of communication and asking what's right for that individual. Um, so yeah, I suppose went against the norm and my dad always used to say, um, God bless him, um, that I'll always do things differently. Um, and I've always done things differently through my life. And I believe that's the way it should be. You should do what's right for you. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Um, so that's um yeah that sounds like an interesting challenge if you on the one hand you're saying that from a from a mother's perspective from a parent's perspective um i i want everything to be quite uh, adaptable and flexible um how does that look on the employer side and i know robin you volunteered to to kind of take that side of the story so um how how do you make it work as an employer when on the one hand uh, yeah you need to have policies you need to have kind of your organizational justice and on the other hand um yeah clearly not not every mom is that not every mom is the same not every dad is the same and their needs yeah certainly and i think you know i can i can speak to it from having uh, worked with a variety of employers to to create those policies but also um I was reflecting back on this question and I've actually always chosen employers with a real uh, ethical kind of a set of values which speak to me and therefore the policies have typically been more in line and headed in a direction with which I agreed and so I can only you know I know there are employers out there who aren't going to create the policies that we all want to see and that's that's also about kind of continuing um to have the conversation um and i suppose it that's where just to, to kind of call that one out that's where we go into the side of things which which we can all hate on um on networking calls and community calls which is where you know the sort of tub thumping you are the pioneers by having that first conversation you might feel like you're getting uh, you know rolly eyes or, or kind of difficult responses but by being the first person to have the conversation it makes it easier for the next person and the next person and the next person and that's really really a key thing uh, because it could, because you will see ahead of steam used um, across organizations I think uh, a key thing to remember when you're going in to have any of those conversations with your employer is that it costs on average you know there are not a lot of different numbers that are bandied around but pretty much the average figure um, is it costs about 28,000 pounds uh, to employ a new person so if you lose someone from your workforce of course it costs about that much including all the costs of advertising getting someone up to speed etc etc it's just it's just a cost that's absolutely absurd for an employer if if the choice is between that and letting someone work slightly different hours or finding you know a way to be a little bit more flexible or to to, to create a job share arrangement um is not that complicated and i think uh, as with any of these these pieces the advice is to go in with facts straight with providing them with a solution rather than a problem in any of these conversations and being really clear about what it is that you want uh, to go for and that also would go for applying for any jobs where you want to to um, have flexibility and um, you know going in and being clear at the beginning 
you know, this is this is the shape of my life and this is the shape, therefore, I would need the job to be. And being really imaginative about that. There are loads of examples of people, of, of uh, pairs of people going up for jobs and saying, hey, could we share this job? We're both really good. We met through this networking piece. This is These are the ways in which we would complement each other by being in this job. You know, can we manage it that way? And just bringing those employers solutions rather than problems that are really rationally thought out. Um, but also having that in your back pocket, that idea that you are valuable. Um, that confidence piece that Becky mentioned is so important. Um, in, in just keeping throughout your maternity leave and anyone who's on the call now who doesn't yet have children but who's who's you know planning to go down that uh, that route find it thinking in advance what are the ways in which I'm going to keep um, myself me and keep uh, valuing myself as you go through that maternity leave so that you don't find you, you're coming with surprise to that confident that uh, lack of confidence at the end and if you're in an employer who who uh, has any support services speaking to them before you go off because it will happen however confident you are and however incredibly talented you are you'll still be that talented at your job you won't be as confident to know that you're that talented at your job um, thanks robin um, so you talked about the transition now um, between uh, yeah, getting, getting pregnant and uh, going on to maternity leave and managing that. And Danielle, Danielle you've had uh, a yeah, very um, hopefully kind of special experience that hopefully won't happen to, uh, to many of us, but maybe can give us some, some confidence that we can also deal with tricky situations. So maybe you uh, want to share your story with us. Yeah, so um, some of the things that, that Robin and Becky have already covered um, have really resonated with me, just on a, on a personal level anyway. I think um, I've done two different sets of maternity leave and both were very different. Um, so with my first little boy, who's three, um, I'd come back, uh, I'd interviewed through, uh, through the early stages of my pregnancy for a promotion. Um, I remember kind of hitting those confidence roadblocks because I'd just come into a new role. Um, there was a bit of stretch there, there was a bit of scope um, for, for my own development. And three months into the role, I had to announce my pregnancy, which again, I tried for a long time for, you know, for, on a personal note, we were ecstatic, but I was extremely nervous about telling my boss, kind of going through that, oh, you've just been promoted and now you're going off on mat leave. Um, with my first um, period of maternity leave, again, I did the typical nine months. Um, it wasn't quite how I expected it to be myself either. Um, so we had quite quite a complicated um, birth. Throughout the maternity leave, I developed postnatal depression and anxiety, which massively affected me. Um, ordinarily, I'm quite a confident person. You know quite happy in my role uh, quite you know happy to have those difficult conversations and essentially be that person that, that raises the point first of all I've had no issue with that I found maternity leave gave me quite a rude awakening the first time round, and I did experience those huge confidence issues coming back into the role and um, not knowing what to expect I think the beauty of that first time around was the support network I had around me. Um, you know, my peers, uh, my line manager uh, were excellent on that. Um, something similar happened second time around. So again, um, I think I'd been, I think I'd been into a new promoted role for about five months and then fell pregnant again. Um, I'm not getting promoted anymore. <laughs> so. Uh, again the, the same thing happened and then sort of further down the line I think I was seven I was just coming up to six months pregnant um, when the announcement of Mulvan's insolvency came out um, and I'll, I'll never forget the look in our head of people's eyes um, when, when they had to read out the announcement um, me standing there very heavily pregnant um, and I think for me the initial news of that in the situation I was in personally I'd kind of saw myself at a bit of a crossroads so I thought right okay how can we approach it ultimately I'm fortunate enough to be far enough along to bring my maternity leave forward if I need to it's not part of the plan you know I may have to 
reduce the time that I'm going to have with the baby, but it's not impossible to deal with. So I'll just go out for a few interviews, go out for a few roles, you know, see what's out there. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Then I think what I naively kind of went into there was the impact that feedback can have in an interview process on your confidence. Um, so, you know, the, there's, there's only so many times that you can put yourself out there for a role that you know you can do um, and have somebody come back and, and have a complete U-turn. So over the phone, video conferencing, because I was still working um, with the insolvency practitioners. So a lot of things were done virtually, obviously, you couldn't see my bump. You know, everyone was fine about it. You know, it seemed to be going really well, really positively. And then I immediately hit that roadblock as soon as anybody could see me. Um, I had really great conversations face to face, um, which left me thinking, oh, you know, maybe it's all in my head. Maybe, you know, I am kind of looking at it a little bit skeptically um, to then get phone calls from agencies to say, you know, well, you're not quite going to be a cultural fit you know I'm all for culture I think culture is a really important part of the workplace you know and and the leadership teams that I've been a part of in the past have done huge amounts of work on making sure that it is the right culture it's the right environment but to give that as the only the only bit of feedback that you get from an interview or god forbid you don't have enough cloud experience because you don't throw in Azure or AWS you know it, it is hugely damaging to your confidence at that point. And I think going into that maternity leave period where you know you're going to be away from the workplace for a while, you know, you're then almost going to reinvent those confidence roadblocks because not only have you not been able to get a job whilst you were so pregnant, but how are you then going to overcome those same roadblocks when you've come, you know, you've come away from the workplace for a number of months? One second, my Alexa is interrupting me. Stop, Alexa, stop. I did mute her, I promise. I knew it was going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, that really, really struggled. And I think um, something that I really loved about Auden, um, again, similar to what you'd mentioned yourself, Robin, um, you know, going, going for those roles and those, those organisations that seem to see your values and have those values themselves. Um, and I think you know, the, the CTO there essentially asked me straight, you know, do you think you've not got another job because you're pregnant? And, and ultimately I had to lay it on the table. Absolutely. Yes. Nobody wants to pay for me to go off and have a family and, and look after me in that sense. And I think from that point, it just got better and better for me. Um, you know, Auden are, are massively forward thinking. Um, so not only was I in a position where I was offered the role, um, but then I found out other things that were added benefits. So, you know, their benefits package apl applies from day one. You don't have to pass your probation. They don't teach, you know, they don't treat you any differently because you're in probation. You know, so all of these things were hugely alien to me. And as quickly as the confidence issues were there, they were automatically taken away in the fact that, you have been hired in this situation, you know, you, you are being looked after, you are being supported and you're not being treated any differently just because you're about to go off and have some time away with your family. Just on that, just on that point, actually, I don't know whether people know this, but actually there's been a study and maternity leave actually only equates to 2% of actually your career. So, you know, when you, when you look at companies and that, if they do not um, treat fairly people around maternity leave, paternity leave, adoption leave, et cetera, it's only 2%. And this is why I don't think, I don't know why companies don't realize that fact. Like Robin said, how much it costs to hire an, a new person, a new employee. No one's, I think if it was a, like a customer and the FD was going right, well, someone's saying we've lost this customer at this amount, they'll stand up and realize. But when it comes to HR and things like that and people related issues, they don't treat it as very much a business, it's like a business partner reason, et cetera. And I just think companies need to get into that way of thinking as well. I, 
I just wanted to, so, so I've just gone through this with someone in, in my team who um, approached me. She's the top performer in my team. Uh, she's approached me because she's wanted a promotion for a while. We've not been able to do anything within the team. So she found a role in a different area of the bank. So um, obviously been very supportive of, of, of that. As she's been going through that process, uh, she called me up to say, Dan, I've just found out I'm pregnant. Um, and I, I think I'm going to re re uh, retract my application for, for the role. So we talked that through and, um, you know, and she said, oh, I feel really guilty that I'm kind of leading people on and stuff. And I said, well, well, what, are you telling anyone else about your, your pregnancy at the moment? She said, well, no, because I've not, I've not had the, any, any of the scans yet. I'm kind of only, you know, six, seven weeks pregnant. So, so then you wouldn't, this isn't common knowledge, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from, but this shouldn't change anything. Just carry on going through the process. Anyway, long story short, um, she, she called me on Friday to say that she'd been offered the role and, and uh, she, she's accepted it. And then she called me today to say that she just had a, her first catch up with her boss to be. She's now had her scan. Everything's fine. And she said, um, you know, I, I'm going to, uh, I've told him and, and uh, that, that I'm pregnant. And I said, oh, what was his reaction? I said, oh, fantastic. That, that's great. So, and as you would expect it to mm. be. But I just think if you, you know, her, her immediate reaction to just withdraw herself from, you know, th that pool, I just, I just find it incredibly sad. And, and just one, one, one of the really quick thing, because I, this, this, it kind of put me in a place um, where the closest I've probably related to a lot of stuff that I hear women talk about is uh, a few before my daughter was born a couple of years ago and before my wife was pregnant with her um i went for a promotion uh internally at work um and it was uh, a fully london-based role and i uh, was in the interview speaking to the hiring manager and the hiring manager said do you have any kids i said yes i've got one boy and she said uh are you planning on having any more kids and i said well i may i, I thought this is just Which chat is right <laughs> so 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 i i i thought this is just rapport you know we're chatting about our families and stuff so i said yeah probably uh, i think i'd like to have two kids and she said how would you feel commuting to london every day with a newborn baby Oof. and that was the first time where i felt like the shoe was on the other foot a little bit and it made me feel so uncomfortable that i had to justify my own and then you start getting into well that that's fine for me but should it be fine for me? Is there something wrong with me that that's fine for me? And it, it was, it was absolutely horrible. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Could I add something to just, uh, to that, uh, sorry, Raina, to um, dive the time. But I think on the other side of that, Dan, as well, it, it is so fantastic when you find out that somebody um, is pregnant, but also I've lost count of the number of conversations I've had with pe with women specifically entering a period of their lives that kind of, you know, anywhere from kind of 28 all the way through to, to 40 where they come and ha I'm having a conversation. I'm like, so what's next for you? And they're thinking, oh no, I'm planning to have a child. I'm planning to have a child and actually getting all the way through the process to having a child is a really difficult, bumpy, complex road i hope uh, you know I'm, I'm sure we've all got our own experiences on this uh, in this group so so kind of trigger warning but you know leaning into those opportunities so that you can be uh, confident happy and content in your professional life with so you're building that because life will happen good bad and ugly on the other side is really really important and it's really important for that well-being as you go through the whole the whole of your the curve of your kind of of your career and your personal life as well yeah i couldn't agree more they, they do feel that there should be more um awareness around things like ivf and adoption and things like that you know those conversations are still not happening enough in terms of that openness between employee employer without that judgment i've heard a bit of a theme over the last like from all of you really around uh, around confidence and um, there are certainly a lot of uh, issues that that you've uh, brought to the table and uh, that's that you've um, yeah that, that's that you've addressed uh, what do you think we can do as women to boost our kind of confidence and to sort of to yeah to kind of not um, hold ourselves back just because we are uh, planning to be a mom or we are moms Yep. Do you want me to? I can. Anyone? Yeah. Oh, just yeah. Just uh, 
<laughs> from my experience, um, for a long time, I sort of did that, tried to think about, oh, I'm going to hold myself back and not put myself forward um, and had some really challenging experiences on that. But more so that now I think, well, what's the, what's the real situation, you know, um, can I actually do this? You know, I can do this um, make sure I have, I suppose I have those moments of doubt. And I think during going through this period of lockdown, it's, it's probably more heightened than ever that got to homeschool, got a young daughter, got business to run and things like that. So you have those moments of lacking in confidence, but I almost sit there and stop and reflect and go, right. Okay. What am I thinking in my head? Is that the truth? Is that the truth of the situation or is it just something that's spiraling and spiraling in my head because of the situation? And then having a network of people that I can trust um, and that are really honest with me that I can literally speak to and go right, I'm feeling this. Is this actually factually true? And then, you know, realizing also what I can control and can't control. I'm a great believer of that. And I'm sure everyone's seen that circle of trust, um, circle of control, circle of influence, circle of can't control and things like that. So there's sort of some tools that I have um, in my back pocket, should I say, um, that I, I tend to bring out. But I've got to say, um, I'm, I'm feeling it at the moment in terms of from that confidence piece. We're talking about it today, about this virtual imposter. I'm quite a sociable person and um, do love going out on the network, talking, talking to people. And because I've not experienced that for the seven weeks and being behind a screen, I do feel that that's really impacted my confidence. But I then I always look at things in a, in a positive way. And for what we talk about at Tech Turners, and um, we've had a real challenge of um, talking to companies that might not understand returners. Um, and I do feel coming out of this, a lot of people who are going to be returning to work will probably have more empathy of people than returning to work and probably understand it because they'll probably going through the same challenges that people returning to work will do. So when I'm having those conversations going in the future, I think they'll be more accepted and people can empathize with them more. So, um, yeah, so, so sorry, rambled on a little bit, but I suppose those are my sort of points on that, that subject. All right. I think of it, not not from a yeah. obviously a, a, a women's uh, perspective, but I, th I I think from an everyone's perspective is 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 this is this thing leaping? Is just being in your own head and deciding the outcome of something, whether it be a conversation or an action, before even starting to go down the path of that conversation or action. And I think so many people do it, and you know it's rooted within our DNA from a time you know prehistoric times where if you walk through a dark wood, you might get a tiger jump out at you and maul you so in the future it might be a good idea not to walk through that dark wood but we don't we don't live in those times anymore and i think that the the tools that that i try and use for myself and also try to talk to people about is that if you're at step one don't worry about step 10 so if that's applying for a job don't see the job spec and, and think, oh, well, I don't know if I fit in that organization or oh, I don't know if I could do this this one element of the job just you know, if you take each step at a time, which is reading the job spec, applying for the job, going for an interview, meeting people who are at that company, then when you get to step 10 and have to worry about that, you're already at step nine. And the jump from step nine to step 10 is very, very different. And it's more real than the intangible uh, headspace jump of step one to step 10. Um, and then if I can add just a couple of uh, techniques that, that we've shared. Um, there's just using some really sort of simplistic things which are kind of like your future self will thank you for making the time to do this um, and it's really important to remember that you're not necessarily doing it for yourself today you might be doing it for your future self when you go off on maternity leave write down who you are what you've achieved what you can do write it down in really re in really good detail so that you know and you can check back to it and every time you feel like that confidence is wobbling right before you go on a kit day right before you do whatever it is you need to do or go to a breastfeeding class if you're nervous about it read that because that is who you are and there was a day when you were that person and you wrote that down and that's okay and then there are other you know really simple tools and i'll put them in the chat in a moment ago thinking about what's the best case scenario the worst case scenario and the most likely case scenario um to just calm that anxiety anything that's in your mind and then the other thing 
that we often see is people coming back and they're just so have created so many routines in the home and then they're coming back into a set of routines and rituals um, back in the workplace which are kind of new or, or just slightly different and there's a bit of a question there about how can you take any rituals that you know are kind of con consistent in the workplace and bring them into your home how can you at the end of a, a week or a month probably not not the first three months but at the end of the week or the month do a retro of that week say what's gone well what hasn't gone well what have you achieved do a stop start continue and that will also if you write that down on a big bit of flip chart paper or whatever that will also give you a head of steam to be saying do you know what i'm structuring this really really well we're nailing our sleep routine we're doing this that and the other and actually those transferable skills and those pieces of empathy which you bring back in as a parent which you bring to the workplace which are so valuable to the people who work with you um when, when you are a parent uh, you will start to see them and build them and be able to take them back in that's really great advice. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Um, I think just on oh. what Dan had said, oh. sorry, Mona. No, no, no. Um, kind of, again, the techniques that Robin had mentioned as well. Um, something that hugely helped me through CBT for my anxiety following my first child. Um, it was kind of knowing how to break that cycle. So something that the, the class, the, the sessions taught me was to try to recognize, recognize those physical triggers within the body when you are catastrophizing and when you are taking it to the worst case scenario, which is quite common. Um, so something that it did was kind of go through those really unhelpful patterns of thinking, which can make you kind of believe that something is going wrong or, or kind of feed into those confidence issues. Um, and it's quite a cheesy sort of americanized tool um and that's that's not der derogatory in any way but um she there's a lady um who does quite a lot of motivational speaking over in america called mel robbins um and someone actually recommended her five second rule uh, to me and and essentially what that does is it breaks the chain of unhelpful thinking so once you kind of consciously are aware of oh i'm having a conversation in my head that hasn't happened yet or I'm running through a scenario in my head and I'm trying to predict the future and it's making me feel worse. Once you hit that point, you count down from five. And what that does is it gets you into a different part of your brain. It brings you back to consciousness and you're, you're in your forward thinking. And then you're looking around your environment to, you know, what can you see? What can you hear? What can you feel? I'm, I'm bringing you back to being present um, and kind of what that allows you to do is obviously to um, to kind of bring yourself down that scale of, of uh, catastrophe, if you like. And that was hugely helpful to me. So I would recommend checking out her videos um, if for anyone who's struggling with things like that. How bizarre is that, uh, Danielle, that you were talking about that. I was Googling at the same time and popped it in the link <laughs> in the chat. Sounds like we have some very, uh, very, very similar, similar stories. Things, yeah, <laughs> very much so. It was just bizarre because I thought, oh, I forgot to mention that. Again, and then I was just like googling it and pop the link in and you started speaking about it. <laughs> That's great. Um, so we've got only five minutes left or maybe maybe four if we also want to make our way to our doors to clap for our NHS. Uh, I wanted to close on a bit of a lighter note um, around um, work-life balance and uh, what are some uh, coping mechanisms that you all can recommend um, you know, during lockdown? Um, how do you deal with, uh, with kids during lockdown and homeschooling and, and all the, and uh, even your, um, yeah, even just structuring your life? Um, in, in these uh, situations. Oh yeah, I don't mind uh, going first. I think um, work-life balance is um, it's, a, it's it's a term that I actually struggle with because I I I feel like life is everything, and you can't balance work against life. I think that it just integrates. Now I'm kind of a fluid person anyway. So I like my work and my family and everything to blend into one. This is not what I wanted this lockdown. Um, but so, so I think, um, I think if I was sum summarizing the way that we can talk to ourselves negatively and we can really beat ourselves up and we can really judge ourselves, I think someone said this to me on, on uh, the, the other week that really stuck with me, which is, when you start talking to yourself or doubting yourself negatively, just think, would you talk to anyone else in that way? 
And if the answer's no, then sure as hell don't talk to yourself in that way because you're really important. Thanks, Dan. Yes, yes, you are. All right. Any does anyone want to uh, add a final remark or Naomi? Do you want to say something, or you're just saying goodbye? Um, I'm nervously trying to decide whether to say something, which is just sparked by <laughs> what I was saying there. Um, something that's been helping me is, especially with like family being around all the time, is being much more aware of my kids seeing me, and I don't want my son to be I want him to grow up resilient I want I don't want him to grow up as somebody who sulks when things go wrong or who like criticizes himself too much so that's trying that's helping me put a lid on when I do it sometimes not all the time but not great at it but as I'm doing it right now but <laughs> when he's in the room I'm trying to um to act how I'd like him to act and that's helping me it's just like being on show behaving a bit better so not talking down about myself so much and being a bit more cheerful when things go wrong and and it's kind of faking it till you make it really mm. uh, thanks a lot for those closing words um and also um do uh, yeah do have a look at the group chat if you haven't uh, already done so everyone there are some really great tips in there as well some great conversation going on um so yeah we're finishing just in time to to clap um, so thanks a lot for attending the event. I think it's been, um, yeah, it's, it's been a great pleasure and uh, really uh, great tips in here. Uh, Rachel, do you want to say something too? I was just going to say thank you so much for chairing, Mona. That was really amazing. And thank you so much to our speakers, Robin, Becky, Danielle, and Dan. Um, and thank you to everybody who came. Um, it means a lot. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Bye. for hosting. Thank you very for much. Have a nice evening. Bye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.